All right, Algebra 2, we're talking about, this is the second video, video 2, and uh, we want to talk about writing the polynomial function in standard form, uh, which comes from this particular graph. So here we have a graph, and we want to uh, identify the zeros from the graph. So obviously we can see that it looks like it goes through negative 3, positive 2, and positive 5. And if we were to write the factors out for that, since it's a function, we have to have a y value. So we write our factors. From negative 3, we get x plus 3. From positive 2, we get x minus 2. From positive 5, we get x minus 5. And to get it into standard form, of course, we're going to do FOIL. And take your favorite method, whether you want to... Um, uh, do it as in its box form or draw the arrows. I'm not sure if you what you want to do, but I'm going to put these two together. So that would be x squared and minus 5x and minus 2x from those and lastly a positive 10. Uh, then I can put these together. That gives me x squared minus 7x when I put the uh, linear terms together uh, and a plus 10. Of course, we can't forget that that still is being multiplied times x plus 3. So, basically, I am going to be doing this again. Just a bigger box. So, x squared and x, that's x cubed. Seven, minus 7x and, my, and times x is minus 7x squared. Plus 10x. 3x squared minus 21x, and lastly, 3 times 10 is 30. So I can finally write my answer. x cubed, y equals x cubed, minus 4x squared, minus 11x, plus 30. And that right there is my equation. Now I'm not going to ask you um, uh, where, what the max, relative max or min would be. Uh, but I'm going to ask you things like this. Between which two consecutive x-intercepts or zeros would we find a relative maximum on the above graph? Uh, so if I go back up there, relative maximum, that would be located here. That's a relative max. And so it occurs between 2 and 5. 2 and 5. Yes, I know that negative 3 is a 0, but it's not consecutive. I want the two zeros that are on either side of the relative max. In this case, it would be 2 and 5. Let's take a look at the next question, another situation where we want to write the equation in standard form. Well, let's look at our, um, our zeros. We've got a negative 4. 0 itself is also one of the x-intercepts, and 3. Now, something's different is happening here. This bounces off the x-axis. That must mean it has an even multiplicity. That being said, then I know that x plus 4, which the 0, that's the factor that comes from the 0, has to have an even exponent. We're going to assume it's a 2. Uh, I don't know if it's a 4 or 6 or so forth, but... Uh, we're going to assume that it's a 2. Actually, I do know it's a 2, but that's a different reason. It's something I won't talk to you about right now because that'll be confusing. I do also see x uh, or 0 there, so I could write x minus 0. Although most of the time when we do write this, uh, we always put it in front, uh, and we just write it as x. And then lastly, we have x minus 3. So... This is what we're dealing with. Now we can put that in standard form, right? First of all, I'm going to handle the uh, x plus 4 times x plus 4. That's x squared, 8x, 8x, and 16. What in the world? Why did I get 8x? Okay, what is going wrong with me? That's a 4x. Good thing I caught that mistake. Whoo! That is awful, man. 
You're probably all going, what is wrong with that teacher of mine? I know some of you are. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to continue with this, and you'll notice that I'm just kind of holding on to that x for a while. I'm not doing anything with it until the very end. So this is, I took the x minus 3 and moved it down here, and now I'm going to multiply into the box again. x cubed uh, plus 8x squared plus 16x and negative 3x squared uh, negative 24x and minus 48. So x cubed, that's plus 5x squared minus 8x minus 48. And now I'm going to distribute the x into the whole thing, giving me x to the fourth plus 5x cubed minus 8x squared minus 48x in standard form. How do you find the x and y intercepts of a particular function? x and y intercepts. Well, every y intercept in the universe that we know of has an x value of 0. So the first thing I could do is I could plug in a 0 for all the x's. Right? Yeah, of course, that's 0 times negative 2 times 7. And when you multiply those together, you end up with 0. So right away, we know that the y-intercept is 0. But since the x-value is 0 and the y-value is 0, that's the origin. That must mean that it crosses right at the origin. Therefore, that's an x-intercept and a y-intercept. So out of my y-intercepts, I know I've got 0. What about my x-intercepts? Well, the first one on my list is 0. But what do we know about every x-intercept in the universe? It has a y-value of 0. So let's think about our original equation, setting the uh, y-value equal to 0 and solving. Please don't foil all kinds of stuff together because you're looking for the solution to this. We already know that 0 is one of the answers. That's pretty obvious. That's one of the x-intercepts. But then we must include 2 and negative 7. Pretty easy when it's in factored form to identify the x-intercepts and y-intercepts. Oh, just a brief moment. No. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is factoring. Factoring is the same thing as division. Uh, a lot of times I talk to you about factoring and I said to you that the first thing you should do is look for a GCF. So in this case it's a 2x which would uh, leave me with x squared plus 5x plus 6. We could continue to divide that into simpler pieces because we know numbers that multiply together to give me 6 but add up to 5. That would be 2 and 3. So we can factor something. Factoring is just dividing it. Okay, the division can get more complicated. Uh, remember that for something to be a factor, it must go in evenly into something, such as a 2 is a factor of 6 because 2 goes into 6 three whole times without any remainder left over. Now, what if I said divide these two things, x squared minus 3x minus 40, by x plus 5 to see if x plus 5 is a factor. The only way that would happen is if the remainder from the division would end up being 0. Uh, let's just remind ourselves about the long division. Okay, we'll just do it with some numbers here. Uh, 13 does not go into 2, but it does go into 28 two times. Now, I don't take the 2 times the 10 or the 2 times the 3. I take it times both of them, the, the 10 and the 3. I know that seems kind of dumb because you're thinking, well, it's just 2 times 13 but it is really 2 times 10 and 2 times 3. That's how we get 26. Now, I always tell my students to distribute a negative 1 and add. And it may seem trivial at this particular moment. You know, you might say, well, why doesn't he just say subtract? 
Well, when we get into the more of the work of the long division, you'll understand why. So I subtract and I get uh, a 2 there, and I can carry down the 7, or I add the negative, I should say. Once again, 13 goes into 27 two times, and I can take this and multiply times both of those values, giving me 26, distribute the negative 1, and add. Now, we're big boys and girls. We're not going to write 22R1 like we did when we were in elementary school. Uh, you probably will write 22 and 1 over 13. In other words, you take the remainder and you put it in a, in a fraction over what you were dividing by. And I hope everybody knows that that's the same thing as 22 plus 1 thirteenth. And that's the same thing as 20 plus 2 plus 1 thirteenth. Because that's how, we write pro that's how we write polynomials. We have to separate them into their individual pieces. Um, like this. I know we would never do this. I know you would never write 20 plus 2 plus 1 thirteenth. But that's how we will write it when we do our division. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can answer that question. Does x plus 5 go in evenly into that? So the first thing you want to do is, is focus on the firsts. x squared divided by x. Oops, sorry. x squared divided by x. And you end up with x. So you put that on the line. So x gets multiplied times both of these things, giving me x squared plus 5x. Distribute the negative 1 and add. Those cancel. Negative 8x. Carry down the negative 40. Focus on that and that. Negative 8x divided by x is negative 8. And now you multiply this times both of these, giving me negative 8x minus 40. Distribute and add. So when I got a remainder equal to 0, the answer to the question is yes. x plus 5 is a factor. It goes in x minus 8 times. That's the final answer to the question. But you're right. It goes in evenly. Therefore, it's, um, it is a factor. All right, let's try it again. So I take first divided by first, 2x cubed over 1x. It gives me 2x squared. And I distribute 2x cubed minus 8x squared. Put like terms under like terms. Distribute a negative 1 and add. Carry down the negative 18x. Focus on 5x squared divided by x. 5x squared divided by x. That's going to give me 5x. Then I can multiply 5x squared and add. Distribute a negative 1 and add. Bring down the negative 8. Focus on the 2x and the 1x. 2x over 1x is the number positive 2. When I multiply that, it gives me 2x and a minus 8. Distribute the negative and add. Remainder is 0. So x minus 4 is a factor because the remainder was 0. Okay, we'll try again. This time the remainder is not going to end up being 0. So I take the first divided by the first, x cubed over x, that's x squared, and I multiply, giving me x cubed minus x squared. Distribute the negative 1 and add. Carry down the negative x. 
focus on these two. 4x squared over 1x. 4x. So that gives me 4x squared minus 4x. Distribute the negative 1 and add. Carry down the plus 2. First, divided by first, 3x over 1x. Distribute the negative 1 and add. So my answer to this is x squared plus 4x plus 3. But instead of putting r5, I'm going to put plus 5 over x minus 1. Now, there's another type of division from long division called synthetic division that you also have to know. So I'm going to handle the same question that I did just a second ago. Since we were dividing by x minus 1 in that last question, the very first thing as I take the 0 that comes from the factor and I put it in this little box. And I take the coefficients of what I'm dividing. Coefficients are the numbers in front. So 1, 3, negative 1, 2. 1, 3, negative 1, 2. The last one goes on the other side of this little line. The first thing I do is I carry down the first coefficient. Here's what I want to do. I want to multiply these two together. And I want to write it in the next row. And then I'm going to add down the column. Multiply. Add. Multiply. Add. So let's take a look at what we have. We have the remainder. We have the constant term. We have the linear term, and we have the coefficient of the squared term. Exactly what we got before. It's a lot easier. A lot of kids like to use synthetic division. I want you to practice it. We'll practice it in class as well. Now, what happens if you have a division problem, but there are missing terms? Don't forget to put in zero. Put in zeros. So, for instance, from x plus 3, the 0 would be negative 3. Now, let's look at our coefficients. I've got a 1 for the cubic term. I don't have a squared term, so I'm going to put 0. I don't have a linear term, so I'm going to put 0. And the last thing I'm going to put is the constant 27. Carry down the 1. Multiply. Add. Multiply, add, multiply, add. So what am I left with? Zero for the remainder, nine for the constant, uh, negative three for the linear term, and uh, one for the x squared term. Obviously, x plus 3 goes in evenly, had a remainder of 0, so x plus 3 is a factor. The last thing I want to tell you about is called the remainder theorem. The remainder theorem is pretty easy. It says uh, I've got some polynomial, p of x. What's the remainder of that polynomial being divided by x plus 2? Now, could I use long division? Sure. Could I use synthetic division? Sure. But the remainder theorem says take the zero that you get from the factor. In this case, it would be negative 2. Take that value and plug it in here for x's.
So we have negative 2 to the third plus 4 times negative 2 Um, so I plugged in negative 2, oh, whoa, what am I missing? Square, Woo, man, that's almost. That's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, that's negative 8. 4 times 4, because we know that 2 squared is 4, so that's 16. Negative 8 times negative 2 is positive 16, and then minus 6. So negative 8 and 16 is 8. 8 and 16 is 24. 24 and 16 is 18. That is the remainder. If you were to do the synthetic division or the long division, you would come out with 18 for the remainder. But that's all it says. The remainder theorem just says, take the 0 from the bottom, stick it in the top for all the x's. It is not that difficult. See you in class. Make sure you practice a few problems one or two problems from each, each of the little parts of the sections. Uh, make sure you know how to do everything in 6.2 and I'm pretty sure everything in 6.3 also. Uh, and then we'll practice in class.